VSWR, or Voltage Standing Wave Ratio, crops up in a variety of areas associated with radio frequency technology. What really is it, though? In this video, we'll explain what VSWR is and how it arises with the help of some diagrams and animations. And then we'll look at some of the key equations, so you'll have a really good understanding of what it is. First of all, let's start with a basic explanation of VSWR. Within a radio frequency environment, power is transferred from one point to another using a transmission line or feeder. These feeders may be a variety of forms. They may be two parallel wires known as a twin or open wire feeder, or more commonly coaxial feeder or coax for short. Other forms of feeder may also be used, but essentially they all act as feeders. These feeders are said to have a characteristic impedance, and the maximum power transfer occurs when the feeder transfers power to a load having the same impedance as itself. Similarly, the maximum power transfer into the feeder occurs when the source has the same impedance. If we have a 50 ohm feeder, say, and a 50 ohm load, then all the power is transferred from the feeder into the load, and everything's fine. If there's a mismatch where the feeder impedance and the load impedance are not the same, then it's not possible for all the power to be transferred, and the remaining power does the only thing it can and travels back along the feeder as a reflected signal. And where the feeder is a reasonable proportion of a wavelength, voltage and current standing waves become apparent, as we shall see later. Let's see how this works out. If we have a perfectly matched load as we have here, the power travels along the feeder, and we can see the voltage waveform here. As we have a matched load, all of the power is absorbed and none is reflected. There is no reflected voltage waveform. This is the ideal case for most applications. Now let's look at the case where a short circuit is applied to the end of the feeder instead of a load. Here we see the voltage waveform moving forwards to the load, or in this case a short circuit. At the end point the voltage must be zero and power is reflected. A reflected voltage waveform is seen and the overall voltage at any point along the line is the sum of the forward and reverse voltage waveforms. It can be seen that the voltage is always zero at the short circuit point, but it rises to a peak of twice the forward voltage further back along the line, but more of this later. Similarly, if an open circuit is applied to the end of the feeder, the voltage waveform moves towards the open circuit and again power is reflected. The current is zero at this point because it's an open circuit, but the voltage rises to twice the voltage of the forward waveform, with troughs and peaks back along the feeder. Where do these peaks and troughs occur, and what do the plots of voltage along the line look like? For example, let's take a look at the case of the short-circuited line. Here we see the voltages arising from both the forward and the reflected power again. As the power is reflected, we see the combined voltage at the short circuit is zero. But further back along the line, there's a point where there is a peak. If we make a plot of the combined voltages and currents of a short-circuited line, we see a plot like this. The shape is quite distinctive, looking a little reminiscent of a set of half sine waves joined together. We also find that if a much smaller mismatch is applied, the plot looks almost sinusoidal, as we see here. Then, for an open circuit line, we see a similar set of waveforms. The voltage resulting from the combined forward and reflected power is at a maximum at the open end of the feeder, whilst the current is zero. And likewise, for a smaller mismatch, where the impedance is above that of the feeder, we see the plot reminiscent of a sine wave again, with the voltage being higher at the point of the load. It's also worth realising that there are no power standing waves. Power is reflected from a mismatch, and there's forward and reflected power. These are constant in either direction, assuming no losses. It's the voltages and currents from the forward and reflected power that combine together to set up the voltage and current standing waves, as we have seen. Now we can define the voltage standing wave ratio. It's the ratio of the peak voltage along the feeder or transmission line to the minimum voltage. It varies from plus one to infinity, and it's always positive. 
It's typically given as a ratio like 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 or even infinity to 1. And a perfect match is 1 to 1. It's also possible to look at the VSWR in terms of what is termed a reflection coefficient. This is another ratio and it's the ratio of the reflected wave to the incident wave. The reflection coefficient is normally denoted by the Greek letter capital gamma. The reflection coefficient can be used in an equation to work out the VSWR, which we can see here. It's also useful to be able to calculate the reflection coefficient from a knowledge of the line and load impedances. Remember, though, that the load impedances, if they are items such as antennas, are normally complex with both real and imaginary parts. Another useful equation calculates the VSWR from a knowledge of the forward and reverse power levels, since these are proportional to the square of the voltage components. This equation can be very useful, especially when directional power meters are used. So in summary, we have seen that the maximum power is absorbed by a load when the load impedance is matched to the feeder impedance. When there is a mismatch, power is reflected and the resulting overall voltages and currents from the forward and reflected power set up standing waves along the lines. The level of VSWR can be calculated and also measured very easily.